Please have a seat. We'll start the second paper. Okay. The second paper uh, is Adaptive Learning, Persistence, and Optimal Monetary Policy, uh, presented by Frank Smets, co-authored with Vitor Gaspar and David Bestin, and the discussant is Francesco Lippi. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Sweet. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I, uh, I'm neither a student nor a co-author of Alex, but having worked for uh, almost 14 years uh, at, in a central banking environment, it was hard not to get inspired uh, by his work and also it was very hard not to, to meet him because he was a very much uh, a guest very much in demand, especially in, in sort of European uh, central banking. Uh, and of course, his, his, uh, his work on, on central bank in, independence and, and on, also on transparency has, uh, is still very much, uh, very much uh, of, of has contributed a lot to, to the, the current very positive outcomes, I think, of, of monetary policy uh, frameworks. Now, this paper is uh, um, within the sort of the general field of, of optimal monetary policy. Uh, um, but it uh, sort of goes away a little bit from the assumption of, of, of rational expectations. So what we will do is we um, characterize optimal monetary policy responses when agents use adaptive learning. Um, in particular, we will assume uh, that agents uh, use constant gain least squares regressions to update their formation of inflation uh, expectations. Um, now, why uh, do we think this is uh, an interesting thing to do? Um, well, there's several reasons. First of all, uh, learning, uh, we think, is, is sort of a reasonable alternative description of, of how agents form uh, inflation expectations. Uh, I think the rational expectations sort of literature and revolution has been sort of, I mean, very important. Uh, and again, the, the work of Alex uh, in, in applying this to uh, the monetary policy field, I think has been crucial in, in, in uh, shaping uh, the institutional framework of, of central banks. Um, but of course it does uh, require uh, a number of, uh, or it assumes a number of, of uh, very strong assumptions, in, in particular, uh, at least in the standard sort of rational expectations monetary uh, policy uh, models. Uh, in particular about um, the, the knowledge that agents uh, have. So it requires an extremely sophisticated inference. Uh, and of course in the presence of, of model uncertainty, it's often unreasonable to, to assume that agents know exactly how uh, the economy works, what the information sets are of the different agents, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and constant gain least squares, least squares learning is, is sort of a small deviations, uh, from, deviation from um, uh, rational expectations. So we, we would, one could call it sort of boundedly uh, rational, which makes sense if uh, there are possible structural breaks uh, in the economy. Uh, in particularly the gain, which is uh, sort of the window over which uh, agents form, uh, run their regressions, will, in some optimal sense, reflect the probability of, of uh, breaks happening in the economy. Uh, secondly, especially when you look at inflation expectations, uh, there is uh, some work that suggests that modeling the formation of those inflation expectations as based on so the constant gain least squares regression uh, seems to work relatively well. And, and I think Athanasios may uh, say a few words about this uh, in the next paper. There's also work by, by Fabio Milani and, and, and many others. So we think it's a reasonable alternative and so the question is, well, how does that change all the sort of normative implications that uh, people have derived, people like Mike Woodford have de derived for uh, monetary policy? So that's really the question. Uh, secondly, um, there has not been uh, that much work that looked at what adaptive learning or perpetual learning uh, means for uh, optimal monetary policy. Again, I think uh, uh, Athanasios, Orfanides, and John Williams here have done uh, path-breaking work to, to show uh, 
that when agents form expectations through, through uh, constant gain least squares learning, uh, this will affect uh, the optimal policy prescription. And they've done it in, in the context of simple linear feedback rules that, that turned out to be uh, optimal in, in the rational expectations model and show that, uh, or one of the results is that the central bank should be less activist, put less weight on output gap stabilization when uh, agents are, are learning in this sense. Uh, so one of the important insights uh, from their work is that uh, central banks should um, try to focus on anchoring inflation expectations which then avoids that a sequence of cost push shocks in the same direction pushes up the estimated degree of inflation persistence making the cost push shocks uh, more costly. So um, I think there are now a couple of papers that go into the direction of deriving optimal monetary policy analysis and, and so our paper is one, one of those. And then a third reason why we were interested in studying uh, optimal monetary policy with inflation learning, uh, with um, uh, adaptive learning, under adaptive learning by agents, is that we were interested in, in, in sort of knowing what the implications are uh, of the interaction between learning and monetary policy for the degree of inflation persistence. Uh, there's a big debate about uh, whether uh, sort of reduced form measures of, of inflation persistence have changed uh, lately, whether they have uh, persist, the inflation process has become less persistent. Um, uh, in our setup with this uh, adaptive learning, uh, you have sort of a general, an, an, a general mechanism by which uh, the persistence may change in response to different uh, policy, uh, uh, policy regimes and, and policy reactions. And, and so one focus of the paper is actually to show what are the implications for different policy rules or policy uh, regimes for, for the degree of inflation persistence. Okay, so what I'd like to do uh, in the rest of my talk is, is first give you the, the framework, the laboratory that we will use to analyze this problem. Um, I'll set up uh, or I'll talk about adaptive learning uh, about the simple rule that we use as a benchmark for the optimal policy uh, exercise uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, the solution methodology, well we won't talk much about solution methodology, more about the results, the findings and, and do some sensitivity analysis. Okay, the, the, the model we, we use is a very simple one and probably uh, known to, to those of you who have uh, an interest in, in, in monetary economics. It's sort of a, a very standard uh, hybrid New Keynesian Phillips curve, which you can derive from uh, a certain set of, of micro foundations based on a monopolistic competitive goods market and some, some sticky price, uh, some reason for sticky prices. In particular, in, in this particular case, we will assume the Calvo setup whereby firms uh, receive a signal whether they can change their price or not, which is sort of independent uh, over time. Uh, in order to get the hybrid form, which means that uh, inflation will not only depend on expected future inflation, but also lagged inflation, that's the gamma pi t minus one term in there, we also assume some indexation, some partial indexation to lagged inflation. So, but otherwise, it's sort of a standard uh, hybrid New Keynesian Phillips curve. Inflation depends on lagged inflation, on uh, expected future inflation, on the output gap, xt. So kappa is the, the uh, slope of the Phillips curve. And then there is a cost put shock, um, which again can be microfounded in a number of ways. Now this is the, the, the model also that you will find in, in Woodford's uh, book, Interest and Crisis. And Woodford has shown that um, uh, when you uh, derive the, the welfare-based uh, or a quadratic approximation of the welfare-based uh, uh, loss function, then in that, this particular model, it looks like uh, LT here. So it, it's basically a weighted average of a semi-difference in inflation and, and the output gap. And uh, the lambda here will be a function of kappa, the slope of the Phillips curve. It basically will be kappa over theta. So where kappa is the slope of the Phillips curve and theta is the, the markup in the, in the, uh, in the goods uh, sector. So it's sort of this uh, micro-founded 
uh, loss function in this, uh, in this particular framework. So that's basically uh, the model or the framework that we will use. So we will assume that Sandbank has this objective function and that it faces uh, uh, this, uh, this economy, this, this Phillips curve. And for simplicity, we will also assume that the, the instrument is xt, so the output gap. We could complicate that by uh, also introducing an IS curve and linking the output gap to the interest rate equation. But uh, given the sort of the numerical uh, uh, sort of uh, way of solving the problem, uh, this would, uh, it's easier to, to just assume uh, that um, the central bank sets uh, the output gap directly. Uh, but I don't think this will affect very much the, um, uh, uh, any of the results that we'll talk about. Um, now, of course, the two, the one, one, so one important difference from the, 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 the normal setup is that we will sort of generalize the way expectations are formed. So instead of assuming what's, what's uh, uh, standard in, in this literature, assuming rational expectations, so the agents, the price setters basically know the structure of this economy, we will replace it by a constant gain least squares learning uh, uh, algorithm. And so then the question is, how does that little change affect uh, optimal monetary policy? Now, in order to have some, some, uh, some benchmark, I think it's, it's useful to, to should show you very quickly what uh, optimal policy is uh, under rational expectations. And, and I will focus on, on the case under discretion. Basically, under discretion, it's assumed that central bank cannot con commit to future uh, policy actions. And as, as a result, it cannot uh, affect inflation uh, expectations, uh, which um, uh, will be our benchmark. Now in that case, uh, in this particular model, uh, the optimal policy rule, so central bank that maximizes this loss function, very simple, uh, the output gap will be a function of, of the cost push shock. Um, so when there's a positive inflation surprise, the output, uh, the central bank will uh, um, tighten monetary policy, will thereby create uh, a negative uh, output gap. And how much it will tighten will depend again on the slope of the Phillips curve, so that's the kappa, uh, and also, of course, on, on lambda, which is the, the weight on output gap stabilization in its, its, its loss function. Now, if you plug this uh, optimal policy rule into uh, the Phillips curve, you can solve for the inflation process. Uh, and so the reduced form uh, inflation uh, process for inflation will just take the form of an AR1 uh, process in this particular model. So inflation will just be a function of its lag, where the lag coefficient is gamma. So that's the, the sort of degree of intrinsic inflation persistence, or the degree of indexation in, in this model. And it will depend on, on the, the cost push shock. Of course, if we would uh, look at the case of commitment, then we know that uh, you will get a more complicated reaction function. And again, as, as, as Woodford has emphasized, uh, in particular, we'll get some history dependence. So the output gap will not only depend on the current shock, but it will also depend on, on, on uh, past, uh, past uh, endogenous variables, such as uh, inflation, or could be the output gap itself. So that's, that's basically uh, the, the benchmark, uh, the, the rational expectations benchmark uh, we want to use. Uh, and again, the reason, the second reason for, for sort of showing you the rational expectation solution is, uh, solution is also to show that in that, under discretion, inflation process will follow an AR1 process. And that uh, basically justifies or, or uh, is the reason why when we then go to the adaptive learning uh, case, we will assume that agents uh, estimate an AR1 process for for inflation. So they don't know, in this case, they don't know the precise structure of the, of the economy, uh, but uh, they, uh, they think that uh, inflation follows an AR1 process, and so they will estimate uh, this, uh, this AR1 uh, process for inflation in order to then form uh, their expectation for future inflation. And they will update this CT. So CT is here the, the, the estimated degree of, of persistence they will update this CT according to this recursive least squares uh, 
formula. So this is, these are the two uh, equations. So the coefficient CT will just be updated depending on current inflation surprises, so to say, the pi T minus pi T minus 1 CT minus 1. Uh, and of course, the, also the moment matrix RT will be uh, updated in, in this process. So this is sort of the, 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 the standard formula for uh, recursive least squares. But now, one important feature or one important element here is, is the phi para parameter. So phi, which is this constant gain parameter, which will determine how fast people are updating their uh, regressions, or you can also link it to sort of the average uh, window or the average uh, sample that uh, people use. Um, there's, of course, a branch of the literature that, that analyzes uh, what happens uh, with the stability of the system when phi is uh, 1 over t, so when you basically lengthen the sample as new information comes in. This is the whole work of uh, Evans and, and Honka Poya. Uh, and in particular, in this particular case, so with this form, given that it is the, the actual uh, reduced form in the rational expectations uh, model, uh, you can show that under fairly general conditions, if, you, if there's no uh, change in regime, and you let the agents learn according to those rules, over time they will learn the rational expectation. So there will be a, uh, a, uh, a convergence towards the rational expectation. But this is not really the case that we're looking at. So we're looking at the case where phi is, is a small uh, positive number. So it will not converge, it will be constant. So there's, there's, there's basically, uh, it's a constant gain learning. And as a result, when shocks happen, these, this, this parameter will shift uh, over time. They yes, time. yes. Uh, well, that, that's actually the next slide. Um, so one, one sort of question you have to, to uh, sort of confront in this particular setup is which info is available to the agents when they run those uh, regressions. And in general, uh, you will have a simultaneity problem in, in those forward-looking models. So inflation, current inflation depends on expected future inflation. But expected future inflation depends on this regression. And in order to update your regression, you have to observe current inflation. So there's this similar thing. Now, one, one way of solving it, like you would do, do in rational expectations context, is to sort of solve for the fixed point. Right? Uh, this is actually partly what we, what, uh, we will do. Um, in the sense that, uh, so one solution, if you don't want to do this, this uh, fixed point uh, calculation, is to assume that agents only use lagged information to uh, run their uh, regressions. And we will actually have an intermediate case. So we will assume that agents use current inflation in the forecast. So when they make their forecast for future inflation, they will observe current inflation. Of course, current inflation will have to be in equilibrium uh, consistent with their, with their forecast, given that current inflation depends on the forecast. But we will not uh, uh, allow them to update their current CT. So CT, C, the C, the, the, their estimate of the autoregressive parameter they use, will be a lagged lag period. The expectation at time t of pi t plus 1 will be CT minus 1 times pi t. Um, again, uh, this is uh, maybe somewhat of an ad hoc assumption if you um, the sort of intuitive uh, justification we use here is that basically it's, it's harder to update your sort of model than to observe the, the, current, the current inflation. Um, we, can, we, we, we haven't really explored yet to what extent this particular assumption. One of the reasons why we didn't want to put CT there is because that, that, that fixed point problem is, is, relative, is, is quite complicated, very highly nonlinear. So it, it uh, at least, maybe now we can do it, but when we started, this looked like a, uh, a problem we wanted to, to, to avoid. Um, OK, so if you put this expectation into the hybrid Phillips curve that I put up uh, before, uh, basically, inflation will be determined by lagged inflation, the output gap, and the shock. And the coefficient here will depend, of, of course, on the uh, previous period estimate of the degree of persistence. If this CT minus 1 in the past is the same as the rational expectations 
coefficient, which is gamma, then this, this term here drops out, right? And you see that in that case, the degree of, of persistence is just gamma. So th then basically you're back in the, in the rational expectations. Um, but of course, when it differs, then obviously this will affect the degree of persistence in, in inflation. OK. Um, now let me uh, first, so I'll show you some, uh, obviously this is, uh, this is sort of a highly nonlinear problem that we, we are not able to solve analytically. I, we, I will show you some, some sort of first order conditions which to some extent you can interpret, but um, uh, most of the results will be based on, on, on actual uh, numerical uh, solution. Uh, of this, this problem. So let me first of all tell you uh, what, in, what the benchmark parameters are that we are used. The gamma, we assume 0.5, so that's the, again, the degree of intrinsic inflation precision. It's a, a parameter that's often found in, uh, in uh, uh, empirical stu in studies that um, uh, estimate empirically the hybrid new Keynesian Phillips curve. Uh, theta is 10, so that's a markup of 10%. Again, it's sort of a standard. Uh, calibration parameter, uh, for example, in the, in the Woodford book. Alpha is the degree of price stickiness. It will de determine kappa to some extent. So we assume that uh, it's uh, two thirds. It means that average stickiness of prices is, is about three quarters. Uh, and basically, that sort of those parameters basically imply the, the reduced form parameters, which is the kappa, the slope of the Phillips curve, the lambda, which is the the weight on uh, the output gap. Um, and then phi is this gain parameter is, is 0 0.03. I think we took this from, from, uh, from the work of, from, uh, of uh, uh, Athanasius. Um, it's uh, a window of how many quarters? Uh, <laughs> 10 to 20 years. 10 to 20 years, yeah. Um, OK, so, so that will be the, 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 the sort of the base, baseline uh, calibration. Um, now, uh, so, so how, how do we solve for the optimal monetary policy? Well, uh, we basically take a, a value function approach. So, I mean, in the basic rational expectations model, uh, actually there is no state variable in this. Well, the only state variable is the shock uh, under discretion. Now, under commitment, there will be one uh, additional state variable. Now, because of the learning uh, equations here, uh, there will be four state variables in the economy. So there will be the current shock, there will be lagged inflation, which comes in through uh, the intrinsic uh, degree of inflation persistence. There is uh, CT minus one, which is the, the coefficient, the estimated coefficient of uh, inflation persistence by the agents. And then there's the moment matrix RT, right? Uh, and so we try to, to solve this, uh, we try to minimize this uh, value function with respect to xt, subject to, again, the Phillips curve, the two learning equations, and then the, the forecast equation, right? Um, and so the way we do it, we, we use uh, methods that uh, uh, have been uh, uh, suggested by Judd, and there's this uh, very nice book by Beranda and Fackler that sort of shows you how to, how to do it. So we approximate V with cubic splines and then um, try to numerically solve this, this, uh, this problem. Um, just actually let me just once say one. So, so if, if you think so about this problem and, and, and the instrument being XT, I mean obviously the central bank can directly affect current inflation, right? Because the output gap enters the inflation equation uh, currently uh, in the Phillips curve. Uh, now, how, how else can it affect? So what, what do these other uh, state variables tell us? Well, uh, CT, current CT uh, depends on current inflation. So one way the central bank will be able to affect the economy is by affecting CT uh, through this basically expectational error. So by creating inflation surprises, so to say, it can move the persistence parameter in one way uh, or the other. Uh, the other way, but I won't talk very much about that because it turns out that at least in the benchmark case, numerically, this, this channel 
does not appear to be very important. It can also affect the moment matrix, basically the, the, the uncertainty about inflation by affecting pi t. So RT is, is a sort of given, but RT plus 1 it can affect through uh, this pi t squared. So it can either make inflation more uncertain, in which case the updating will happen uh, sl more slower, slower uh, or it can uh, make it less uncertain and then the updating will happen more quickly. Okay, let me first, before going into sort of how in, under optimal monetary policy the central bank responds to, to shocks, let me first uh, compare the macroeconomic outcomes in the benchmark calibration case between the rational expectations model under commitment under discretion and the learning model under fully optimal monetary policy and under the simple rule, which is basically this rule that we take from the rational expectations under discretion. So the output gap just responds to current shocks. Um, and uh, actually let me first uh, look at the variances of, of output, output gap and this semi-difference of, of inflation. And here the variances are relative to the commitment case on, on rational expectation. So this is basically the best you can get. If there are rational expectations, so there's no uncertainty coming from, from the learning process, and the central bank can commit, then you basically achieve the lowest, uh, lowest variability in the economy. So we take that as a benchmark. Um, obviously under discretion, which is the second uh, column here, uh, there is some uh, deterioration of, of, of uh, macroeconomic stabilization. There's actually some improvement in the output gap, but uh, quite strong deterioration in, in inflation. So the variance increases by 17%. If you have learning and you basically apply the same rule, so this again, this is this simple rule where the output gap responds to the cost push shocks, uh, then, of course, sorry, uh, this was 1.37. 1, 1 this is a typo here. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, and the rational equity. Then you see that actually on the output gap side, not much happens, but especially inflation, the, variance, the variability of inflation increases uh, quite a bit to 1.50. So learning obviously is a source of, of, uh, of uh, um, variability uh, in the economy. Uh, then when, you, when we try to, uh, when we um, let the central bank know the full structure of the economy, so it knows that the agents are uh, running uh, their, uh, these, these uh, constant gain uh, regressions, uh, then again you see that the stabilization of the economy is improved, so uh, the variability of an output gap increases somewhat to 1.02, uh, but uh, the uh, variability of inflation drops quite quite quickly. So in, in general, the optimal learning, uh, optimal policy on the learning basically brings you quite close to or, or closer to uh, the, the commitment case, as, as you would as you would expect. Um, now, what does this imply for autocorrelation and persistence? So, for those of you who are familiar with the sort of the policy literature under. Uh, rational expectations and comparing discretion with commitment, one of the things that, that has been emphasized a lot by, by, Wood, by Woodford is that under commitment uh, basically you get history dependence. And the way this is shown uh, in this particular simple model is that is if you look at the autocorrelation of the output gap. So under discretion, which is the second column, the autocorrelation of the output gap is zero, right? Because the rule just says, just respond to the shocks. And the shocks are serially uncorrelated, so there's no serial correlation in that case. Under optimal policy on the commitment, you get quite a bit of persistence on the output gap. And this is exactly this idea that by committing to uh, increase uh, or tighten policy further in, in the future, uh, you actually stabilize current, current inflation. Right, so, um, and of course that's what you see in, in, in the bottom uh, line here. The inflation variability drops quite uh, dramatically from 0.50 to uh, about half, 0.25. So the benefit of commitment is really to, that you can stabilize inflation expectations through a history dependent uh, policy. <laughs> now you get very similar outcomes under, under learning. Um, so also in this case, what you see is that obviously, again, if you take the same rule, 
the rule is the same. It only responds to the shocks, which are serial and correlated. So the serial correlation is zero for the output there. Uh, the, the serial correlation and inflation is higher than under rational expectations. And that's exactly the point that, that Athanasios and John Williams uh, made, that learning increases the persistence of the inflation uh, process. But when you go to optimal monetary policy in this framework, you get very similar sort of movement as comparing uh, discretion and commitment under rational expectations. So you create much more persistence in the output gap, 0.56, but that's close to 0.60. And the benefit is that the, the serial correlation in inflation is much less. So it drops to 0.33. And of course, now the question is, well, why, why, why is that? Because it, it's clear that this cannot be the same mechanism <coughs> as is working under rational expectations. Under rational expectations, the way optimal policy works is that it basically promises to tight when there's a positive cost push shock, inflation, positive inflation surprise, it promises to be tighter even tomorrow when the shock is, is back to zero. And that has an effect on the current inflation expectation, and that reduces the current effect of the shock. This is how. So it, the, under rational expectations, this policy works by, by actually promising future, future, uh, future policy moves in the same, same direction. And so the, the benefit is really that you can sort of stabilize the effects or smooth the effects of cost push shocks over time. This cannot be the mechanism working in, in, in the constant gains least squares learning case, because there, of course, expectations are completely backward looking. It's very mechanical. Agents are just running those regressions. So the question is now, how, how does the central bank get this inflation persistence down? And how do we, why is it that we get output gap persistence up in this case? I mean, this is just, before we do that, just, this is the sort of the measure of the welfare uh, loss. So you see that uh, uh, you get relatively close, so there's quite a bit of gain from doing the optimal monetary policy rather than following the discretionary uh, role. Um, okay, uh, actually, just to, so I showed you some of the moments. I mean, this is the full distribution uh, of the variables. Um, uh, in underlearning, in, in two cases, the the, uh, the blue uh, dashed line is the case of the simple rule. So that's the, the, uh, the rule under rational expectation that would pre uh, be optimal under rational expectations and discretion. Uh, the green line is the, uh, the outcome under the optimal uh, rule. So you, you basically see here the full distribution. I think the most, Im the most important picture to look at is the distribution of C. Okay. Um, where you see that uh, 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 basically what optimal policy does, it shifts the whole distribution of this estimated persistence parameter to the left, and it makes it more tighter. And actually, the important thing actually is, is what happens here. So under the simple rule, you actually get cases where inflation becomes explosive. In that case, what we do, we follow again uh, a trick uh, by Orphanes and Williams. We just uh, uh, stop... We, we don't let the agents for update further. So we just, so when they start estimating routes above one, we just uh, assume that they, they don't update and, and keep one. But anyway, so that's, of course, where things become very costly, when the inflation process becomes uh, unstable. What the optimal policymaker or the, the policymaker that optimizes uh, fully does is it basically makes sure that it stays away from this region where uh, the estimated degree of persistence is very high. Uh, and so uh, in, in the process, it shifts the whole distribution to, to the left. Uh, this is the distribution for the moment matrix. Uh, let me just skip this. So, uh, what, so what can we say about characterizing the, uh, the, um, the, sort of the, the optimal monetary policy? I mean, this is one way of writing this first order condition. And of course, it's, uh, I mean, it's not an explicit uh, uh, function because there are these expected V's <coughs> in there which are basically the expected marginal benefit of changing a certain uh, parameter. So VC is the expected marginal benefit of uh, uh, a change in the C parameter. 
Um, but anyway, uh, I think it, it is actually quite useful to, to stare at this a little bit to understand uh, what's going on. I mean, the first term, basically, you retrieve this uh, expression in uh, the, the red box here if you assume that lagged inflation is equal to zero. So let's just take a case where, by chance, lagged inflation is zero, which is, is, is the same as the target and then see what the optimal policy reaction looks like. In that case, it simplifies it to this simple expression, which looks very much like the simple rule. The only difference is that now there's this chi t squared in the denominator, which is here, which will depend on the ct minus 1, the past inflation. And the intuition here is very, very simple. If the uh, estimate of the agents is the same as gamma, as the intrinsic uh, persistence of inflation, then basically, and pi t minus 1, then basically the reaction is the same as the optimal reaction under discretion. So then we're back to that case. We basically retrieve that case. Of course, when CT is higher than gamma, so when agents, for some reason, just because of a sequence of shocks, have, have updated their estimate, uh, uh, have increased their estimate of the degree of persistence, then you, will, you can easily see that the reaction to cost shock will be much stronger. And again, the mechanically, this is quite, uh, or intuitively, it's quite uh, easy to see why that's the case. When there's more perceived persistence, then any shock will have a larger effect on inflation. And given that the central bank sort of trades off inflation and output gap stabilization, it will, some of that response it will take into, into the output gap. So that's, that's, uh, that's what you have. So this is one important mechanism that's going on. But this is not really very different from what happens in the uh, rational expectation. In the rational expectation, you just don't get this chi t because the, the, the expectation formation function will be constant. I think more interesting is, is the second term, which really captures the intertemporal trade-off that the central bank faces. So uh, the important uh, part here is the second term in the, uh, the, the, the numerator which has this expected T of VC. So what this term, this term is always negative. Uh, it's actually not something we have, we have been able to prove, but it has been there in all the simulations we, we've, we've looked at. What it says is that the expected value of lowering persistence, perceived persistence, is always positive. And again, the reason is very simple. When, when, when persistence is low, then future shocks will have smaller effects on, on, on inflation. And so that will be uh, good for, for, for the stabilization of the, of the economy. And so what this says is that what, what learning does, because the central bank can actually affect this persistence parameter through the creation of sort of inflation surprises, it can steer the C parameter and what it says, this type of, of, of effectiveness will lead to a negative response of the output gap to past inflation. So again, we introduce some type of history dependence in this setup. But now the setup, the history dependence, comes from the fact that the central bank wants to affect the CT, which is this. this and it realizes it can do so by setting policy uh, a little bit more tight when inflation is positive or a little bit less tight when inflation is, is, is negative, so when the deviation of inflation. Um, I mean, I don't have much time. There are a number of cases we can look at here to sort of refine this, uh, this analysis, but I think the basic intuition or the mechanism that are, that are strongest in driving the results is, is exactly this, uh, this intuition. <coughs> okay, so let me just then show you um, uh, how the policy responds to a cost push shock. So this is, these are just uh, 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 mean dynamic responses of the economy in, in response to a positive one standard deviation cost push shock for three uh, initial states. So in, in each of those, pi t minus one is zero, so inflation is, is at the target uh, in last period. But the, the perceived degree of, of persistence is different. So the blue line is when the degree of persistence is the same as, as on average in this economy, is 0.33, right, which is lower than the, the intrinsic degree of persistence, which was 0.5. And then we, we look at two cases, one higher and one lower. And so you see those two effects on, of, of learning on policy uh, happening in this, this, this dynamic. When, so this is the response of the output gap, right, the, the policy instrument. Uh, 
when persistence is lower, then obviously the central bank responds less. Uh, so that's what you see here in the initial effect. Secondly, when persistence is lower, uh, there's less need to respond persistently to, to inflation. So you get more persistence uh, as uh, the degree of persistence. So and then basically that's what so this that's what really drives uh, this, these outcomes that I, I mentioned uh, before. Uh, that um, also under learning, optimal policy will basically create history dependence in the sense that the instrument will become uh, serially correlated um, uh, and, and, and it, the, the mechanism again will be through inflation expectations but now it will work sort of more mechan mechanistically or mechanically through its effect on the perceived degree of persistence. Uh, I mean this is the, uh, this, so this is the same mean dynamics but here we plot the perceived estimate of of uh, inflation persistence, so the blue line is again the average, so there it doesn't move, but when it's lower or, 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 or higher, you see that policy tries to bring, and it will succeed in bringing uh, this persistence parameter back to uh, this lower average. All right, let me skip this uh, function and just end with some sensitivity analysis. Um, so, I mean, we need to do more, but uh, let me just uh, talk you through this particular graph. So what we show here is the average degree of persistence in this economy for different gain parameters, so that's the x-axis, and then also for different degrees of price rigidity, for different Calvo uh, parameters. So when the gain is zero, basically there's no updating in the constant gain least squares learning, then Basically, the equilibrium is the same as in the rational expectations equilibrium under discretion. The degree of persistence is 0 0.5 in the calibrated uh, model. This is perceived persistence, right? This is, per yeah, this is uh, average perceived persistence. Um, when you say pers uh, per uh, persistence, you mean per perceived persistence, right? Yes. Confusing yeah. Yeah. Well, in, uh, sorry, in, in, so in the tables I, I showed at the start, it was just the persistence of inflation. This was right. under rational so the, the No, but also on learning. So, so we just simulated the economy and calculated the first order order correlation. Once, once there, is learned, there is learning, then uh, you're talking only about uh, persistence. Yeah. Right? Because this is what policy responds to. Sure, sure. But of course, the, the, the interaction of perceived persistence and policy leads also to an actual degree of persistence of inflation, right? Which, yeah. But this is the average perceived persistence, which is time varying. Uh, in the economy. So it's 0.5 uh, in the rational expectations. Now when the gain increases, so this, is the, this was the, um, the benchmark case, you see how optimal policy is able to, to reduce the inflation persistence. And of course, again, the mechanism is through this updating mechanism. So when, when agents update their estimates, that gives some traction for monetary policy to actually influence this, this, this estimate. Um, you see when the degree of price stickiness, the green one was the benchmark case, uh, when the degree of price stickiness is higher, that means that price stability is more important in this sort of micro-founded uh, setup. Uh, then you see that um, actually uh, the degree of the equilibrium average degree of inflation persistence is reduced. So the value of actually manipulating uh, uh, agents' expectation increases because uh, uh, basically the cost of future cost push shots is higher and as a result you see a fall in, in the degree of inflation persistence. Okay, let me just uh, finish by saying that um, I mean this is very much uh, work in progress and uh, it's always difficult with these numerical approaches to, to really make sure you have everything, everything right and you also uh, understand everything. So we, we think we're, we're almost there, uh, but, but uh, uh, there's still some work to do. Um, eventually, we'd also like to look at learning about the target. So now here we just assume that the target is zero, if our inflation is zero, and there's no uh, time variation uh, about that. So there's no uh, updating of the constant in the inflation equation. And of obviously, the interaction between that and the degree of inflation persistence would be an interesting topic to look at. Uh, we would also like to embed more the commitment case into our learning 
uh, case, but that's that's also for for future. Thank you.